Hello, and welcome to today's uh, online workshop, the Managing the Online Teaching Workload. Okay. My name is uh, Dan Cabrera, and I'm the Multimedia Coordinator for the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. Uh, I've been teaching online uh, in the public health program uh, courses for 13 years, but I really had an online presence since about 1998, where I posted uh, I created my own web pages, and it was kind of the wild, wild west back then. So a lot of a lot of faculty were doing it on their own. Okay. So what I wanted you to do now is is I want I want to get to know you. I know uh, some of you right now, uh, but in the ch in the text chat, can you just share your department or your division and just explain your online teaching experience? Like how many years have you taught online? And maybe you know how many or what kinds of courses you've taught online. Okay, so that's going to be in the lower right-hand corner. You're going to click that little um, purple tab. Looks like a, a Nexium tablet, half of one anyway. And then click on the bubble, and then just type in uh, what you've done. Okay. So what you do is you're telling us what your department is, your division. Uh, perhaps and then explain your online teaching. Okay. Thank you, Marcella. Marcella, uh, KNPE, uh, specifically sports management. Great. One and a half years of teaching online, an average three per semester. That is a nice load. Oh, that's a lot. Of, <laughs> that's a lot. Let's see. Uh, Catherine uh, from the health sciences. Uh, I've been teaching online for many years. Too many to count. <laughs> well, that sounds familiar. Uh, Natalie, I am in the special education department. I'm also teaching asynchronous classes now, but I've taught hybrid and fully online uh, online live classes. You've we had sort of a, the spectrum of, of possibilities. Good for you. Uh, you and Joe. Uh, Department of Public Administration, one of my favorite departments. My wife worked there for many years. Uh, she's taught uh, online uh, classes for more than three years for online masters of public health, admi public administration program, excuse me. And uh, she's currently teaching 100% asynchronous public performance data analysis class. Good, good for you. And Marsha, who's from the School of, uh, of Health Studies, taught many classes online, uh, was even on a webinar panel about Oh, for online teaching, good for you. I'm glad, uh, I'm sure you had something important to share uh, at that point. Myung, uh, special and, and, uh, and early education. She's had about five plus years of online teaching experience. She's teach, uh, taught a few courses in a hybrid format. It's a really interesting, um, I guess, convention, the hybrid format, uh, relatively new, and we're still developing pedagogy for it. So thank you so much for sharing. So now, uh, today uh, we're going to be discussing a few aspects of online teaching workload, uh, including course design, course delivery, and grading. So whether you've designed the course, uh, are preparing to design the course, or the course was designed by somebody else, uh, you'll be able to take away some useful tips today and also how to manage your workload at various steps in the online teaching process. So in this workshop, I'm going to be sharing practical strategies for you to how to keep up with your online courses, which, as you know, is always on. Um, I will also be sharing tips for how to save time in your course design and delivery for how to increase your efficiency. And I'll make the distinction between what course design and delivery uh, happens to be. So the three main sections of today's uh, workshop, as I mentioned uh, just a minute ago, are tips on course design, course delivery, and grading. Uh, we will discuss each of these topics individually, and we'll begin with course design. Thank you, Zach. OK, great. Thank you so much. Let's move on to the next slide here. So well, what is course design? Course design is what happens before your course goes live uh, to students. This is all that labor that, that, uh, that you do uh, when you plan and you set up your course in the best way possible so students can find the, course, the content easily. Uh, there are several ways that we can save ourselves time during the course design process, fortunately. Although I think the bulk of the time that you spend in, 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 uh, when you're asked to teach a course is, is preparing it for 
uh, deliveries. So, so the first tip uh, that I'm going to share is to use existing learning resource. Now, NIU has, has come a long way with increasing and improving access to affordable course materials for students. So our textbook affordability task force has created a resource for NIU faculty that illustrates the impact of expensive textbooks on students. Uh, this resource is, uh, includes uh, ways to discover high quality, low cost, or free alternatives to textbooks. I'm going to be sharing a link to the library's textbook affordability guide for faculty in the chat area now. Let me just make sure I, I let's see, I'm going to grab this here. And now I'm going to put it in the chat area so you guys, now I'm also going to follow up with an email afterwards, uh, after our, our uh, workshop with these uh, links in there, but they're just for your, for your review. Uh, this is uh, also a guide for faculty on how to choose accessible course text so that all students are able to access uh, your course materials. And, and I'll share that link with you as well. So here's another link. Let me just make sure I get all of it. Second link here. Now, some of the open education resources are, they're called OER. Uh, linked on the library website include Merlot, Open Textbook Library and OER Commons, but there are several other uh, linked options as well. You can also add a course reserved copy of your textbook to the library so students who can't afford the textbook can go to the library to complete their assignments. You can either provide a copy of the textbook, for example, if you get a free copy, uh, a desk copy that's provided by the publisher, or you can request that the library purchase the textbook. And of course, this will be done well in advance of when you teach the course. Uh, the library is particularly interested in high-priced textbooks or items that are for high enrollment courses. Uh, the NIU subject matter specialists, these, these folks are, are an excellent resource for faculty, instructors, and students at NIU. So if you want to check out the list of subject matter librarians, um, and you want to get to know them, the, your, your subject matter librarian really well. They can help with presentations on how to use the library resources, locating resources for your class, and really help students as well, which is, you know, a, a, a big salvation for a lot of students, you know, who may be lost and may not know how to use that library, especially when they're early in their academic careers. Now, I can say that instructors are pleased with the support of subject matter librarians that they've worked with, and the presentations that they delivered both when we used to have face-to-face -face class on a regular basis, but also online class sessions. So you really want to get to know your librarian. Another way to manage your workload is to stay organized. So this will be especially helpful uh, as you create content and, and assessments for your course before you begin developing your course on Blackboard. Uh, so you develop an effective system for organizing your course files. And you want to make sure that you back up your work, as we tell all of our students to do, just in case you don't want to lose a lot of work. Now, I know of instructors that save their teaching files in Google Drive, but you can also save them uh, wherever it's most convenient for you, including the NIU OneDrive account. Uh, by organizing your files, you can avoid having to search around for the right file when it comes time to add them to your Blackboard course. So in these examples, I've created a folder for a course. Okay, that's gonna be, it's gonna be this one. This is a folder for the course. And uh, then I've added, uh, folders for each week of the course, week one, week two. Now you can also call them uh, unit one, unit two, or module one, module two. Actually, I, I, I use the module label for how I break up my courses. Okay. Um, so, or maybe some other labeling system, depending on how you want to set up your course. Now within, within each subfolder, uh, I, I would say documents such as my weekly announcements. What are the things I'm going to be telling my students from week to week, sometimes multiple times during one week. Uh, readings. Now it can either be a PDF uh, file or a link to the resource um, or just telling them, you know, chapter one of the textbook. Um, any assignments that you that you want to create. Um, Add documents with a with a quiz or test questions. This is for your your uh, use, uh, and which can help you ensure which can help you ensure your tests or quizzes are balanced or cover sufficient information, uh, or even as a backup. Okay. So you can see I have all of that content. So this exists 
I have, I have it in OneDrive, but this exists before you even start working to develop your course in Blackboard. So if you have links to sources, uh, you could create a Word document or a OneNote document with a list of hyperlinks to save and then share them with your students. Or you can use an external link like Dingo or Evernote. You could also, though, create a class notebook in your NIU Office 365 account, which you can then share with your students. And this is also a great way to involve students by having them also share links or resources that they find helpful or useful within the course. Uh, you can create a collaboration space where you and your students can add and edit content and all the stu uh, and all students can can view all of the content. Okay, so this would actually be in the course delivery component of it like this, but you want to set it up in the course design. You could also create a content library in which you as the teacher can add resources that the students can view but can't edit or add to. So you want to have some control over that. Finally, you can create student notebooks, which are private spaces for each student to add content that no other student can view, but you, but you can also add content to a student's notebook. Uh, so for example, if you think an individual student could benefit from an additional resource, you could add it uh, to their student uh, notebook and nobody else would be able to see that content. Now this is also a great way to involve students by having them also share links or resources um, that they find useful. Uh, within the notebook. You can also create a collaboration space where you and your students can add and edit content and students can, uh, can, can view all of the content. Okay, so in this case right here, now you're opening it up for everyone to see rather than just limiting it to individuals. Okay, great. Another strategy for ma managing your workload is to finalize one module first before moving on to the next module, uh, and you can do that, of course, the next module would either be module one or two, or unit one or two, or week one or two. So by focusing on one module first and trying to perfect it as much as possible, you can then use the module as a template for the rest of your course module. This is something I do myself. I'll give you an example of what that would look like. So that every week you have a specific thing, you might have module introduction and maybe module, a list of module objectives, maybe a weekly greeting, which is what I use. And, and then that's followed by um, a um, um, selection of, of readings, assigned readings. And then if you have a asynchronous course where you recorded your, your lectures, you might have links to those things as well. So it'll be the same thing every single week. So you don't have to guess this, where, where are you going to put a particular component of, of, of a module. So the module that you choose to build out first should be one that represents the structure for most of the rest of your, of your course modules. So probably it wouldn't be a great idea to build a module uh, in the first module because, for instance, uh, there, they, you may have included an introduction to the course and it may not follow the structure or the organization of uh, subsequent modules. Okay, so you want to build out a module that you think will have a good structure that you can base your content-rich models on. Uh, this organizer looks very similar to the module structure for saving your files that we just went through. So from left to right, okay, from left to right, you may begin with the week or the module, and it would be, uh, and then there would be the different sections of that module, these right here, okay, such as the lesson, maybe a reading, assigned readings, uh, any quizzes, discussion board assignments, or, or content that you're sharing. So this is where you're going to think about how you want each module organized. And you want to stay consistent with that, uh, with that organization throughout the course so that students are not guessing where they're going to find something. And finally, uh, you will include secondary links to the actual assessments and discussions, and that would be right here. Okay. So finally, you would include, let's see, now, now this three-level organization uh, will work for the original course view. I don't know how many folks are using the original course view. Uh, but there, there has been some transition to the ultra course view, which looks decidedly different. And the reason I mentioned that, uh, and when I say the ultra course view, it's not the ultra course or the ultra base navigation, map, which is what we all see when we log into Blackboard. Uh, but the ultra course view, which is an entirely different course setup, that you see once you clicked on an individual course, it has that, that, uh, that view. In the ultra course view, there can only be two levels of fol uh, folders instead of the infinite levels that you see creating 
uh, in the original course view. So it really is does take uh, some getting used to. I, I know that I, I kind of sort of resisted going into the ultra course view because I was used to the organization that I had set up in my original course view that I had set up and, and tweaked from, you know, uh, every semester I would make some modifications to it like this. But the change to the ultra course view was so different that I had to think about it. I spent a year thinking about how I was going to reorganize it, which is fine because I, I teach uh, once uh, in the fall semester and so I had a year to think about when, when, when that was done. So the purpose of this, or at least the effect of it, is to make it uh, to make us more aware of how we're organizing our courses and how we're making it easy for students uh, to find the course material. So for an ultra course, we want to make uh, want to be intentional about how we organize our course because we can't really nest content in folders upon folders. Okay, so this this setup right here is is probably only really valid for the uh, original course view. So you can create a template for your modules that you can use to make sure you remain consistent in how you set up each module or week uh, of the course. Now this, this example template outlines the sections of the modules of the course, I should say, pretty much in a consistent order and you can fill in, uh, fill it in with details for each module that you're planning for your course. Uh, you, do not, you don't really have to show this document to students, but it's a great idea to create a consistent template for yourself, or especially if you're designing a course that others will be teaching. This uh, pretty much ensures that other faculty who teach the course that you're designing will be able to understand uh, the logic and the flow of how the course is set up, and they will have a consistent course structure from which to teach. Now, I, I mentioned that there can only be two levels of folders in the ultra course view, okay? So you would create a learning module first, um, then create two levels within the learning modules and the folder and then and then folder content. So that'd be the folder right here and then the folder contents for each one right here. But that's as far as you'll be able to go. Okay. Um, so here's a screenshot of how module uh, one might be set up in, in the course. So I've got a module that would be sort of like week one right here. That's week module one. And then within module one, I've got module introduction, module objectives, weekly greetings. A weekly greeting is simply a video or an audio recording of me welcoming students to this week's uh, module um, and mentioning about the module, what we'll be discussing, maybe even some of the objectives. Um, and also it's an opportunity for me to share information uh, about upcoming assignments or whatever it happens to be. It is not a long thing. It, it, I think at most, the longest I've ever had is maybe four and a half minutes, so it's very brief. Uh, but it orients the students to uh, what to expect for, for this week. And so every week when they come into the new module, this is the exact same format that they're going to see. Then I have the readings and the resources. I have the module presentations. Uh, in this case right here, we had a live session. Uh, but in subsequent uh, modules, uh, it was uh, primarily uh, asynchronous with it, that they would have the recordings right here. And then this particular assignment was to introduce themselves to the course community and actually it was just a link to Flipgrid which actually has them record themselves saying hey I'm so-and-so, uh, this is what this is my my interest in the course and maybe some some things that are a little bit more specific to them like maybe they have a, a hobby they want to share. Uh, so let's see move on to the next slide here. So the next uh, way to save time is to provide students with specific instructions on what you want them to do. So this could be expectations for assignments, such as instructions for discussions or discussion boards. Or it could be instructions for how to use specific course tools, such as Office 365 class notes, uh, notebooks. Now providing specific instructions really helps to reduce students' questions and instructor a necessary instructor intervention and a lot of student anxiety. You can also save yourself time by finding ready-made instructions, particularly for course tools or technologies. Uh, we have a site license for NIU for VoiceThread, uh, through which you can find instructions and tutorials that you can post to your online class to save yourself even more time while designing your course. Now, I, I use um, Yellowdig in some of my courses, and so I found that some of the in instructions, the tutorials work specific to our our setting um, at least initially when you get in when you have to go from the uh, from blackboard your blackboard course 
So I actually created a tutorial on how to, how to uh, for faculty, how to access a, uh, how to create a Yellow Day community and then configure it. Okay, let's see, do I have a question here? Oh, great, thank you, Marsha. Yes, I know, it's a, it really is not used as an assessment tool, it's really used as a tool to, to engage your students to actually create a, uh, a community and a course community, which is great. It's a fantastic tool for, for that. Okay. So when you're teaching your online courses, uh, your course again, uh, you can make process, uh, process uh, even quicker by what we call batch editing your course content in the ultra course view. Uh, this will help you update availability and due dates for all of your courses. So you can change your dates by either a certain number of days or by entering the, the current or the previous start date. And then the new semesters, uh, then the new semester start date, which will automatically update your course uh, dates by that number of days. And so you'll, you'll still need to go back and check the dates and make some adjustments that are based on breaks. For instance, example, if you're moving from the fall semester into the spring semester, you'll have to adjust for Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving break versus the spring break. However, the batch edit feature will help you get your dates at least in the correct vicinity for the new semester of teaching. You can also use batch editing to update availability for, to make certain content items hidden from or visible to students. So in original course, you would, you would just use a date management course tool to adjust uh, course content dates by a certain number of days or by using the course start date to adjust all course dates that are relative to the new start date. So I'm going to pause briefly in case anyone has something to share. I want you to, uh, to feel free to continue sharing. Uh, I'm going to be continuing to move along in the interest of time, uh, but I will address your comments as I see them. All right. So if you have anything you want to share, or if you have a question, please don't hesitate. All right, this next section really is on the actual implementation. This is course delivery. Okay. And I, and as I mentioned, that uh, course design is what happens before the actual course is taught. So course delivery is when you're delivering the course, that's when you're actually teaching the course and it's live. Uh, you want to make sure that you provide students with enough information that, that can get started in the course successfully without you being bogged down with a lot of student questions about how to navigate the course. So you want to provide students with welcome instructions, uh, like I have here, welcome instructions or a getting started section that should be readily visible to the students. It should be one of the first things that students see when they get into the course. Now in the original course view, you could change your course landing page to, um, to a welcome page or an announcement page if that's, what you're, you're, if that's where you want to get uh, uh, getting your start, starting information uh, located. Now for the ultra course view, you can't really change your landing page. So you want to add a dedicated section that provides welcome information. You can see right here, that's exactly what I've done. Welcome page. Um, uh, in this welcome information, you want to provide enough detail that students know exactly how to, how to navigate the course and what to expect. So I have here a, a course welcome introduction. And that's just, it would be just a, a video of B welcoming to the course, what the course is about, maybe the course, a course description with some of the course level objectives. Oh, hold on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. And, and so, uh, and then getting started section, right, which is really important because it actually tells uh, the students, it probably gives them the, um, it gives them the syllabus and the course schedule and some other important information. Uh, but it also it provides them with uh, some instructions on how to proceed. Okay. Usually I, I make this, the course available several days before the actual start. I may even call it module zero. So students can get in and get a head start so they'll know at least uh, what to expect in the course with the, uh, with the syllabus, but also what textbooks they need to, to purchase. Another recommendation I have for helping to manage your, your workload is to create a question and answer discussion forum. And that's something that all students can see. Uh, then you can answer questions in this forum and all students can see the answer. So you hopefully won't get duplicate questions in your emails, for example. So I also provide a small amount of extra credit for students 
who are the go-getters who can answer the question correctly before I even get to it. And this, <laughs> I've seen this happen. It's amazing. Uh, th these are the students who usually do very well on the course anyway. Um, this kind of incentivizes students to check the question and answer board and to look for the answers to the questions, which also helps me manage my workload by having extra set of eyes to help with these general uh, queries. Now, I usually will make sure that, they're, that they are correct in other, other answers, or I'll have to make some, some modifications of it, but I would never think of just letting it go for, you know, letting them have at it. Uh, so that students might be getting information that isn't 100% correct. Now you should also provide students with information about a time frame in which they can expect uh, responses from you. So from email responses and uh, to the question and answer forums, hopefully it will help your students manage their expectations and not really hound you uh, with follow-up emails that you hadn't answered them immediately. So when I, whatever your policy is for handling student emails and forum questions, be clear about when you'll get back to uh, back to them and stick uh, stick to it. So if it's, you know, you tell your students that, you know, if I get an email from you like this, please expect the response within 24 hours, except if it's on the weekend. If that is your, if that is your philosophy, your, your philosophy on, on how to respond to students, whatever it is like that, but it needs to be made clear. So setting those expectations for how you reach back to your students is really, really important. So, so that you don't have to respond to multiple emails from someone. Hey, you didn't answer my question. I sent you know, half an hour ago. Uh, you may also want to outline for students how they should be emailing you. Uh, what is the appropriate netiquette? This is a big deal for me because I, I don't want my students to do a lot of uh, you know, like shorthands, you know, this, uh, the, the convention for texting and all that stuff. Um, and I also, you know, want them to address me uh, instead of saying, hey, I have a question. You know, that's just, I, I want to allow them bec to become a little bit more uh, cognizant of that, how important it is when you're reaching out to somebody else. So when they go into their, their lives post-graduation, post they'll do it with a little bit more professional uh, polish. Um, so do you want, you want them to include certain information in the subject line. That's really helpful. You want to get an idea before you even read their email what this is about. Um, how should they format the greeting or how should they address you in the email? Uh, what are your expectations for the content and how should they sign their email? Um, so this is going to help you quickly identify who the student is and, and, and what their question is, you know, what, what class section they're in and what, what, uh, what to answer the question that's based on the information. So you don't have to search around and try to figure out who the student is or what class they're in. If you teach multiple classes, you probably know what that is. When say, I'm in your class and maybe you have, uh, like Marsha, you have multiple, multiple classes uh, so the expectation is that they'll say, is that you let them know. I says, hey, I'm, I'm so-and-so from this course, PHET 435. Then it orients you to how to respond better to them and more effectively and quicker. Now, discussion board assignments. Uh, I use discussion board assignments because I, I think it's important for them to apply what they've learned in, in the course. So in the original course view, which is what, you know, everyone started using, uh, unless you're relatively new to NIU, we promote them to promote or encourage people to use the ultra course view. But in the original course view for these discussion board assignments, uh, you can subscribe to a forum, which means that you get notification when somebody posts a forum or responds to a classmate's post. Now, this is gonna help you keep track of whether or how often when the students are participating in the discussion. So that, you get to, uh, so that when you get into the forum, you can either answer questions or provide extra credit to students who answer each other's questions. Okay, and this is really important. However, I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn you that sometimes, especially if you have you know, a sizable number of students and you're using this feature, that you're gonna get a lot of emails. Every time somebody posts something, you're gonna get sent an email. And, and so you wanna ask yourself, is this what I wanna do? Um, it may be useful, at least initially, uh, but maybe, maybe uh, halfway into the course, you, you turn that off. So you know to, to be able to respond to that. I don't have it turned on for that very reason because it becomes unwieldy with all of the emails that are being sent that, hey, somebody responds. But, um, and, and now that I use the ultra course view, I can get notifications in the course activities. Uh, we'll talk about that, uh, let's see. Actually, I'm gonna talk about that right now. So for the ultra course view, there really is no option to subscribe to the discussion forum. However, you can set up notifications in the activity stream uh, and 
this works for ultra uh, for any any original course view uh, because you know the ultra base navigation menu is, is it does it doesn't uh, discriminate by just ultra courses or, or the original courses it actually provides information from both so you can get alert when there's an activity uh, in, in all of your discussion forms uh, now you can't pick individual forms for which you get notified you just you can receive notifications uh, either through email or they're pushed out to you okay and you can see it may be a little hard let's see if i i don't i guess not but right here that's the activity screen that that a lot of folks are may not be aware of, of its value or its utility okay and so it, it simply provides you information and you can see in the no notification uh, setup what happens you know new content is and and discussions anytime that happens new discussion responses from the instructor only or from everyone here i've only checked that uh i i I've checked or selected everyone. Everyone who, who is responding, I get sent out a push notification for that. And then this is also, that's for push notifications. For emails right here, th these are all the reasons why I would get uh, emails, okay? New gradable item that's pushed out, new grades and feedback, new messages, new discussion boards, new content. So you can see it has a lot of value. It does this for all of the courses that you're teaching online though. So. Um, uh, if you're teaching just one course, then it'll be easy to, to decipher, you know, well, this is coming from obviously the one course that I'm teaching. Okay. okay. So, one other way to help save time for yourself and, and avoid having to answer questions that students could find information for in their in syllabus is to actually give them a, uh, a syllabus quiz or a test. Uh, now, I, I have colleagues who assign the syllabus test at the beginning of the semester. Um, and they've done points, they've given points for the syllabus test in the past, um, uh, or they require students to get 100% to be able to move on in the course and access the test. So they can't actually get into the course until they've, they've done this. Once they've looked at the syllabus, and this, this actually is something I, I think is kind of a, a godsend for, for instructors because students a lot of times may not even look at the syllabus or they'll just do a, uh, an initial perusal not very not very uh, carefully scrutinizing it. Um, so some some instructors make make it clear to students that, that they can they should look up the answers in the test to the test in the syllabus and so they're taking the test they could probably take it multiple times so they'd have to look up the answer so that would sort of encourage them to to, to review the syllabus and the purpose of the syllabus test uh, is to make sure students have navigated the syllabus and know where to find important information if they have questions that are that appear later in the semester, they'll be able to come back and they'll remember, oh, that's in the syllabus. Then if they do get a question from a student that is uh, answered in the syllabus, they can toss it back to them and say, hey, the information is in the syllabus. Now, another strategy uh, that I use is to order my module folders in reverse. This is the, the week, you know, week to week to week, okay? And so now this limits scrolling and prevents students from having to search around for the current uh, course content. So having the oldest content at the bottom, so that would be if I was, to, this is just a screen capture, but module one is, is, is a bit further down. Um, and that's the first one. What happens is that since they're reversed order, obviously it's gonna be confusing to students if they see the, the last module. So what I do is I do adaptive release. And so it, it is released on Monday at 12 a.m. in the morning uh, of the week that is appropriate. So right here, we, uh, this, was th th this is this week's. So module 10, reproductive issues, November 1st and November 1st. It appeared at 12 a.m. on November 1st. Now, if students happen to be awake at that time, they could go in there and they could see it. it it's there. So they know from day one that the most current uh, module is go always going to be at the very top. Okay, so that makes it really easy for them uh, not having to, to guess. And of course, I, I put I put the dates so that actually there's an additional more uh, additional information that provides them uh, another indicator of where we are in, in, in time. Okay, and so they don't have to scroll all the way down to figure out, you know, where they are. So, uh, just so that you know uh, that you can you can create your your folders for each one of these things in any direction but you can actually after the fact grab them digitally grab them then move them change the position so that you will have a um, you'll, you'll have 
it in the order that you want. And, and what I'm suggesting is that you have the newest ones at the top, the oldest ones at the bottom. Let's see. Uh, any questions about anything up to now? Okay, I'm not seeing anything coming up. All right, so a big time saver in helping you manage your workload is to use due dates and the calendar on Blackboard. So what you see here is the Blackboard calendar in Ultra Course View on the Ultra. And you can see the due dates uh, as you've add, added them to the course. And so uh, you can see how the due dates will affect your workload and how you establish routine for your course. So if you can see this right here, I actually have a due date for some important assignments uh, coming up this Friday. Um, I have a uh, the assignment, what was it, the, the initial posting for the discussion board. It's always due on Friday. Um, and then the second one, of course, will be due on, on, on Sunday. Um, but right here, and then I also have an individual case study analysis assignment, uh, which is one of the big assignments for the semester. It prepares them for the ultimate big assignment, the end of the semester, which is the team case study analysis assignment. So it makes it easier for me at a glance to see, okay, these are the things that, that I have due, rather than having to go to the assignments and say, okay, when, when is that due date? So this, it saves time for me, uh, but also for the students, you know, we're taking the class, and, uh, they can see that, you know, oh my gosh, I got something coming up. But usually I'm telling them in advance you know, in an announcement, by the way, uh, we have an assignment due this week. Make sure that you have, you've completed all of it. You can submit it early if you'd like. So this is really, really helpful. Now you can also view the calendar for an individual day. So if you click on the assignment in the month, uh, in the monthly view, you can take it to that date. You can see more details about when the assignment is due on that, on that day. I will always, I always have my assignments due at 11:59 p.m. on the due date rather than at midnight the next day because students get confused. In, in my experience about when a student, uh, an assignment is due, if it's due at midnight. Uh, this has eliminated that problem for me and I no longer get students who are emailing me saying that they thought it was due on Monday night instead of Monday morning at midnight. Uh, now they're pretty clear about when it's due. You can also view all of your due dates in the Ultra Course view by clicking the due dates, as you can see in the calendar right here. Clicking on due dates, and it'll give you a listing of all. You can just scroll down to see all the due dates that you have in your course. It really makes it easier uh, so that you don't have to guess as to what the, the due dates are, because you probably have a, a number of assignments, especially if they're weekly assignments. Um, so this will show you a list of the due dates for the entire month, which will help you, and, and students see that uh, what you have due so they can plan ahead. So this is all the due dates for the month of, of November. Now, the best way to use the calendar is to plan out uh, your routine and to make it consistent so that your workload is predictable and that you can stick to a schedule. So, for example, instance, I might schedule my weekly announcements uh, to work out every Monday um, at a certain time. Um, I can schedule this ahead of time or I can log in to post manually each week. Uh, then I schedule every Tuesday and Wednesday as a grading day uh, for the previous week's assignment so I can make sure um, that I keep up with my grading and, and get student feedback back to them each week before they have to submit for the next week's uh, work, which will help them uh, adjust uh, for any expectations that you have and also to improve their work over time. Then when I'm finished grading, I would plan to send an announcement letting students know that the grading is completed and instructing, instructing them to do their feedback before they submit their current week's work. Finally, I might post a reminder about due dates on Thursday to let students know if they have an assignment coming up. Um, I usually, well, I'll do it on Wednesday, give them an extra day uh, if something is due on Friday. I usually have an initial discussion post due on uh, on Wednesday or Thursday, uh, Friday, and then a peer response is due on Sunday, okay, which is also important. So they know. And I do this every week. So after a while, they may start to filter out and not really pay attention, but they've already been trained to expect that. Now, once your let's see, uh, once your uh, your routine is established, you can just keep to that routine up over the subsequent weeks of the semester. 
Uh, you may need to adjust or tweak the schedule if you have a big project due um, or during a holiday week, but you should be able to remain pretty consistent if you built that consistency into your course for each module. And this is for the benefit of uh, your students as well as you. They know what to expect. Now for original view courses, you can find the retention center in the evaluation section in your left hand uh, navigation uh, menu this is of the original course view. Now in this section of the course, you can monitor at risk behaviors for students, which is gonna save you time uh, and go to the retention center to view the students with missed deadlines and a grade or activity alerts that you can quickly contact your students to try to get them on track with the course. This is really important. So you're not waiting at the end of, until the end of the semester to realize, oh my gosh, this person has not been as active as they should be. Now you can also get uh, alerts to the activity stream and the ultra base navigation, uh, which everyone has access to. Uh, you can choose which performance alerts you want to see in the activity stream, including the grade and activity levels, uh, students that are falling behind or absent, or students who are failing the course. Now I, I should say though, and I, I've actually reached out to some of my colleagues. The course activity related to grade, the grades feature is something that is available in the Ultra Course too, but, but we may not necessarily have access to it at the moment. Um, it's just a matter of time. We're working to get access on this feature, however. Now, this feature is going to allow the student's instructor to view information that was previously available in the Retention Center in the original course view. Uh, through the course activity related to, to grades, you can see how much time students are spending in your online course, your student grades, and how students' grades match up with their course activity level. You can also take actions to send students appointments uh, requests or messages. You can also download your course activity data as well as to create a snapshot of student activity at that moment in time. Now I'm going to share a link to the Blackboard Instructor Help page in the chat if you're interested in learning more about this feature, which which we hopefully will be able to use very soon. Let me just get that right now. Let's see. All right. So I'm going to pause briefly here in case anyone has something to share. Feel free to continue sharing. Okay, or ask any questions. Um, if I don't see, I'm going to keep moving along in the interest of time. I have a sense of time urgency because there's so much in this workshop. Uh, but as I proceed, if I see something pop up, I'm going to be addressing your comments as I see them. So next, we're going to talk about how to save time with grading. So we discussed establishing a routine, but, it relate, but as it relates to grading, we can discuss some specific strategies for pacing. Now, not every week will be an equivalent uh, when you're grading. For example, when you have a major project uh, do, which is, I have that this week, as a matter of fact. Now, one strategy is to alternate between harder and easier grading. For example, something that, that will auto-grade, like a quiz, um, maybe alternated with a major project that takes a little bit of time. So for me, it would be alternating uh, quizzes, uh, which I don't even have to worry about because they automatically grade, with grading discussion board uh, assignments, okay? Uh, makes a big difference. If I had to grade, manually grade all of the quizzes, and this is, it's, it's a low stakes quiz anyway, and they can take it multiple times. And um, every time they take it, it's randomly draws from a pool of items that they can take. So it's never the same question twice, or the same uh, quiz twice, it's a small number of, of, of items. But it keeps them incentivized to keep trying to get a better grade. And once they've got a good grade, I say, okay, the worst thing that can happen is you get a, you get a, a a top score on the very first time you take it. I says, you'll keep that grade. And if you take it again and you do worse, you're still going to keep the higher grade. But you want to make, get a sense for what type of questions are being asked uh, in there. Another grading strategy is to use Blackboard interactive rubrics. Now I have to ask in here, does is there anyone who uses interactive rubrics? I mean, I want you to, to push that a little, little Little fellow with the raised hand. Okay, I'm I'm doing that myself. Oh, good for you, good for you, Marcella. It is a huge time saver. I've got about, um, I've got about well, close to fifty students, forty-five students, I guess now, um, who 
I read their discussion board postings every single week. And if I had to provide them information on how I grade them every single week manually, it would be really, really difficult. By manually, I mean I could type in, this is how you did on the, your relation to your knowledge of the subject matter versus the evidence of research versus the blah, blah, blah. So instead, I just click on the appropriate things. And I usually will add a, uh, some feedback to, to them. Um, and depending on, uh, on how I'm, <laughs> whether I'm tired or not, I will use uh, feedback that's unique to, to that particular response if it's appropriate. However, I also save common feedback phrases. I put them in a Word document. And so when there is a phrase that's appropriate, after I've graded the, the, the uh, using the interactive rubric, I will use that. And that saves me. A, I, can, I can get through uh, a lot of my students' uh, discussion board posts in about two days um, by doing that. Otherwise, it would take me more than a week to get through them. This is a big time saver. Let's see. Um, enable grading for discussions. Uh, this is something you want to do. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're going to be grading, if it's gradable uh, activity, this is an assignment right here. And so this is where you would click. As you're creating the discussion board, uh, there is a box to click on grade discussion. Uh, once you click on that, it's going to give you options that you normally would not have uh, if you if this was not a grade book. Like for instance, the the question and answer discussion form, which I mentioned earlier on, is not a graded discussion. Uh, still, it's important and it, and it has the functionality of people posting and then responding to post threaded discussions, but it's not graded. Um, and so this is why you really want to decide how you want to to, to proceed with this. Is it a gradable assignment or not? Um, Use embedded annotation tools. And so there is an there is annotation tools for grading uh, assignments uh, like um, PDFs and Word documents in which you click on it and you can actually type in uh, comments in certain areas of the of the paper that you're grading. Okay. But I want to warn you to be e economical with your comments. You don't want to, it shouldn't be too drawn out. Um, so you want to provide them some information, but you don't want to make it you know, an impossible task for you to get through. Okay, let's see. So you might want to save a list of common feedback phrases, and then you just keep adding to it. That's what I do every, every semester. You want to provide specifics or some examples and ways to improve uh, which are measurable. So you might want to say, great work on uh, outlining the project. I'm seeing improvement and identifying key concepts. Instead of just saying, real good or right on or whatever it happens to be. Uh, your explanation of behavior is clear and concise. Just what I was looking for, that's positive. Constructive would be, please remember to use proper APA citations. This important, this important improvement will gradually increase your point value and academic integrity. Or could you expand on this idea of reconstruction and include an example? So these are things that are really, uh, they're relatively common. Uh, but very useful for students as you give them specific information on how they can proceed and how they can do better next time. Now, once again, I'm going to pause briefly in case anyone has something to share. Feel free to continue sharing. Um, so far, that hasn't happened much. I think I think one person has done that. Marsha. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to summarize uh, what we went through. Uh, which is to design and, and build a course for efficiency. That's the design, designing a course. Um, you want to use existing resources that are available, and there's a plethora of, of uh, available resources. You just have to vet them, see that they're appropriate, and, and, and see that, um, that they're uh, accurate. You want to organize your files before you, you even start building out your course in Blackboard. You want to make sure that you have all your materials that you need in an organized fashion in files that you have uh, either on your computer or in OneDrive or Google Drive. You want to organize the files. You want to finalize one module before beginning others because you can do a copy. You can copy that and, and paste it, have multiples. If it has the same setup, all you have to do is just populate it with the appropriate information for modules two, three, four, whatever it happens to be, uh, so that you're using this as a, a kind of sort of a rubber stamp. You know, uh, it'll look exactly the same. And, and consistency is your friends. It's actually the friend of your, of your students uh, 
as well because it it relieves them from the anxiety of trying to find something especially at the beginning of the semester it can be very disheartening the other thing is you know i, I mentioned about uh doing the um the reverse order of the modules you don't want to have all of the modules uh, uh open at the beginning of the semester just release one at a time so that students don't get overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, I've got 15 modules to get through. Oh, I don't know if I can do this. Just one at a time, okay? So, um, yeah, I mentioned about the use of consistent templates for your course modules for, uh, for anxiety reduction in your students. You want to provide consistency in due dates. So every week when I have an assignment, it's due on the same day of the week. Uh, you want to provide detailed instructions for students on how to navigate your course, and that's part of the getting started uh, component of it or a welcome welcome page and you want to use date management uh, or for the original course view or batch edit for the ultra course but when you're doing course copying from one semester to the next so that the due dates have from a course that you copied in the spring are not showing up for the fall uh, that's where you get inconsistencies and people go crazy <laughs> students go crazy and it says I'm late and when they haven't even uh, the date for the due date hasn't even arrived according to them. It may be something that exists in your in your course schedule, but if you haven't changed it in, in Blackboard itself after doing a course copy, then it won't be reflected. You have to you know, try one of these one of these strategies. Uh, managing your time while teaching. Uh, you want to help students get started. And the reason for that is because you won't have to respond to multiple questions about how to get started from your students. You want to set clear expectations for communication so that your students know how much time it'll take for them to expect expect a response to something that they're a query that they're making uh, you may want to consider using a syllabus quiz and that syllabus quiz is important because it's going to get them to get the students to look through the syllabus to, to scrutinize it a, a bit more and to be able to answer their own questions if they say well where does it talk about quizzes it's going to be in there um, you want to put uh, folders in reverse order uh, with the newest at the top and you set folders to open on a specific date as I do like I had uh, module 10 opening up uh, this week and the reason why I had module 10 and not module 11 is because I had a week off for the students and that was for the midterm which is which is sizable and requires them just to focus on that uh, you want to use due dates and you want to check the calendar and you can check the calendar that if you set the due dates in your assignments and they're going to show up in the calendar it should automatically automatically pop up or populate in the calendar. You want to establish a consistent routine so that you're not guessing from week to week, well, what should I do now? It's already done for you. Uh, you want to create a question and answer discussion forum for, for uh, students who may have questions that are relevant to, to everyone in the course. And if they're posted in a place where everyone can see, then you're not going to have to answer the question multiple times in separate emails. Uh, you might want to use the retention center in the original or the activity stream alerts in the ultra course view to get sort of a sense for uh, who is struggling you know who needs assistance you don't have to go through everyone's uh, grades uh, in the grade center you can actually have it pop up for you and then you want to be efficient with time spent grading so you want to pace yourself um, i don't expect myself to grade all of my students for any particular thing in one day uh, it would not be fair to the students because i'm not as sharp at the beginning of that process as i am so it may be two days or three days. Um, but the fact that when I grade my discussion board, uh, I have a, a, a rubric, uh, which I use. It's an interactive rubric, so it's easy for me to be consistent. Um, I'm not, you know, sort of wandering off or I'm getting tired or whatever like this. It's always going to be the same. Um, I also do the same thing. I have a rubric for my students, um, the individual case study analysis assignment and the team case study analysis assignment. So once again, it's easy for me just to go into and, and to make the assessments right there, click on the appropriate cell for not just the criteria, but the level of accomplishment in that criteria. Uh, essay comment feedbacks, it's really important. It does save you a lot of times and it does provide important information for students because even though they have how well they did for each criteria in the, in the interactive rubrics, um, it, it you may want to provide additional information. And from time to time, I will actually uh, uh, give them specific information for them. And it'll take a little bit of time for me like this, but sometimes that gets saved as a common feedback if it's if, if I see that it's needed more than once. You want to enable grading on discussions if you're going to be do, doing graded uh, discussions, if that's going to be a graded assignment. You want to use embedded annotations in Blackboard 
in the old days when we had a hard copy, people would give us a copy and we would, um, hey, Steve, don't worry, Steve, we recorded this. Um, it, it is the, uh, people would give you a hard copy. You'd be able to write down your comments like this. Well, you can actually do the same uh, electronically or digitally uh, in Blackboard embedded annotations. Uh, you want to be e uh, economic uh, with your comments. And so when, you, when you're doing that embedded annotation, it shouldn't be very long. Okay, it should be brief but, and concise but uh, informative. Um, let's see. I have right here, try the Blackboard Instructor app. Um, you may want to give, give that a try right here, but right now I believe it's only, it's only workable for the original. However, I believe you can actually get into Blackboard uh, using your browser and it should be responsive. Okay. I'm going to send you this list of resources in my follow-up emails. This is Time Management Strategies for Online Instructors, which is a great resource. Uh, I want to be efficient, not busy. Uh, time Management Strategies for Online, they're all great. 10 Tips for More Efficient and Effective Grading, and Tips for Online Instructors, Managing Files, Feedback, and Workload. Okay. The, the, this is where I've drawn a lot of my own material uh, for this workshop. In. All right. So... We have come to the end of our session, but I want to ask, are there any outstanding questions? Outstanding mean, <laughs> meaning questions that need to be asked, not that they're remarkable, although they may be remarkable. Any questions? Well, you're welcome, Marcella. I'm happy that you were here. Okay. Yunsu, Jen? Catherine, Mar uh, Marcia, Myung, Natalie, Steve, Zach. Oh, you're welcome. You're most welcome. So when I send you the email, it's going to be, you're welcome, everyone. Uh, when I send you the email, it's going to contain uh, the link to, the, to this session. Let me just turn off the recording.